later, unquote. The concern here for both men is where the different readings of De Natura Deorum situate Cicero regarding the question of the possibility of divine providence. If Bentley is correct, then Cicero, by siding with the Stoic view of the gods, is allowing the possibility of divine providence as manifested in traditional Roman religious practice. The providential role of the divine is argued fervently by Balbus in Book 2 of De Natura Deorum. Quote, I'm claiming then that the universe and all its parts were initially ordered and are perennially controlled by the providence of the gods. Those of our school usually divide this thesis into three parts. Of these, the first is an extension of the argument which demonstrates that gods exist. If this is granted, the admission must follow that the universe is ordered by their discernment. The second teaches that everything in creation is controlled by sentient nature, which disposes everything most beautifully. Once this is established, it follows that nature has sprung from elements that are alive. The third is the argument inspired by wonder at the things of heaven and earth. Unquote. Balbus continues to argue that while nature might order the universe, nature is subject to divine providence, which has the power to intervene at any moment. This, we must presume, was heavily refuted by Cotta, as, as Balbus himself acknowledged at De Natura Deorum 273, the academics rejected the notion that nature was subject to any other power. I say assume, because there is an extensive lacuna in the text of Book 3, just as Cotta is preparing to rebut the arguments made about divine providence by Balbus. He does, however, write at De Natura Deorum 328, quote, So I like that part of your discourse, in which you spoke of the concord and harmony of nature, but I disapproved of your claim that this could have come to pass only through the cohesion achieved by the unique divine breath, that coherence and permanence is achieved by the forces not of the gods, but of nature. Unquote. In determining whether Cicero's own sympathies lie with Balbus or Cotta, the Enlightenment writers are consequently attempting to align Cicero within their own conflict regarding revelation and natural religion, orthodoxy and heterodoxy, reason and providence. This passage, the, the, the closing sentences of, uh, of the De Natura Deorum, was of utmost significance to how Ciceronian theology could be integrated into the debate, making it a useful case study for a survey of its transmission. One challenge in approaching this issue is forging a clear link between the various available editions and the reader. But thanks to the incredibly useful work of uh, uh, Giovanni Tarantino on Anthony Collins' library, it becomes possible to get a sense of which versions of De Natura Deorum were available for him to consult. Among the various works of Cicero, which Collins owned, were an edition of Cicero's complete works, edited by Jacobus Gronovius. Not quite. No, it's not quite relevant. Um, by Jacobus Gronovius and printed in Leiden in 1692. Uh, a French translation of all of Cicero's works by Pierre Durier, printed in Paris in 1770. Uh, a commentary uh, on uh, De Natura Deorum, written by Pierre Lescalopier, printed in Paris in 1660. An anonymous English translation of De Natura Deorum, produced by the printer Joseph Hindmarsh in 1683. And the edition of De Natura Deorum, produced by John Davis in Cambridge in 1718. There are also a handful of editions from the 16th century, but given the limitations of time today, it's preferable to focus on those editions closer in date to Davis himself, and thus closer to those issues which would impact on his interaction with the Ciceronian text. In terms of how this particular passage um, is represented in scholarship, the emphasis here is on interpretation rather than textual scholarship, as the relevant passage is largely textually sound. There is some variation in the manuscripts as to whether Discessimus should actually read Discissimus, and over the form of the names Cotai and Balbi in this sentence. But these are not sufficiently controversial readings as to change the meaning. Uh, the omission of any annotation by either Janus Gruterus in 1618 or Jacobus, Jacobus Gronovius in 1692 further confirms this point. Uh, these two Dutch antiquarian scholars produced editions of the complete works of Cicero, which focused on textual commentaries, emphasizing the manuscript evidence used to correct the text. 
Any notable problem in the text here would appear in the comprehensive annotations of these two men. It is then in the commentaries and translations that efforts to influence the reader's engagement with the text must be sought. Let's turn first to an anonymous English translation of De Natura Deorum printed by Joseph Hindmarsh in 1683, entitled, as you can see, uh, Cicero's Three Books Touching the Nature of the Gods, done into English with notes and illustrations, setting forth from all antiquity uh, what perceptions man, by the only right of reason, might entertain uh, concerning a deity, exclamation mark. Uh, this is a single uh, duodecimo volume uh, of just under 400 pages. Uh, only a single edition was produced. The translator here may be anonymous, but some sense of the political and religious stance of its printer, Joseph Hindmarsh, can be determined. Based first at the Black Bull and then the Golden Bull in uh, Cornhill, Hindmarsh would, was bookseller to His Royal Highness, and the pattern of his publications reveal a royalist devoted to the Stuarts and deeply hostile to Presbyterianism. From John Oldham uh, anti-Catholic satires upon the Jesuits in 1680 to the controversial anti-Presbyterian work by Thomas Ashidine, the Presbyterians' Paternoster and Ten Commandments of the same year, to political texts such as Arbitrary Government Displayed in the Tyrannic Usurpation of the Rump Parliament and Thomas Cromwell by Thomas May in 1683, and, finally, A Vindication of King Charles the Martyr by Thomas Wagstaff in 1693. Hindmarsh's press supplied the market with works championing both Stuart rule and the established church. The sympathy to the Christian church would be echoed in the translation of De Natura Deorum, which came from Hindmarsh's press, as it presented an interpretation of the text heavily weighted towards orthodoxy. The translation has a clear emphasis on the guidance and interpretation offered by the translator rather than the text itself. Uh, on the frontispiece, the eye is immediately drawn to the promise of notes and illustrations and a statement of intent with regard to what the edition will convey, setting forth from all antiquity what perceptions man, by the only right of reason, might entertain concerning a deity. Exclamation mark. Uh, these perceptions are amply set forth as the translator chooses to preface the translation itself with a discussion of 140 pages in which the content of the text is discussed down to the minutest detail. The opening sections of this extensive preface provide the expected contextual detail, content, occasion, discussion of the author, organization of the book, which are then followed with extensive passages traversing the text following a method outlined by the translator as follows. Quote, let me say, as to this preface, that the aim of it is, by the contents, here, to furnish the connection uh, of the discourse, by the alterations, to reduce the translation as near as possible to the expression of the original, and by the explanations, illustrations, etc., to deliver as true, as clear as might be, the sense and meaning of it. The reader is therefore encouraged to study the translator's interpretations of the text separately from the translation itself. The extent of this treatment in the preface does not prevent the translator from annotating the text itself with brief descriptions of the action in the text uh, to guide the reader, short explanations and stylistic comments. The outcome of this extensive preface is a reading of De Natura Deorum, which emphasizes the strengths of the Stoic understanding of the deity over that of the, two, of, of the other two schools. When summarizing the three books, the second that in which Balbus puts forward the Stoic case, is praised uh, for its, quote, dignity, gravity, elegance, the manifold, even infinite learning of it, and the religious, almost Christian, almost Christian theology of the Stoics, can no words be equal, unquote. This Stoic theology is further elevated by the condemnation of its rivals with the Epicurean stance dismissed as an attempt to overthrow religion of all, and all society and the academic castigated vigorously. When it comes to the conclusion of Book 3, the translator's evident sympathy for the Stoic cause is made clear in his treatment of Cicero's apparent declaration of sympathy located there. The translator experiences no doubts regarding the conclusion, asserting that, quote, he was of a sect that professed to have naught at all certain, as to divine matters especially, so that to a difficult absolutely to affirm anything concerning him, and yet so strong is truth that it was able to force even him, we may see, to pronounce against his fellow academic in, fellow, in favor 
of the Stoic Lucidius. The ambiguous conclusion is ambiguous no more, but evidence that Stoic theism could claim to an, the endorsement of Cicero himself. In the actual translation, the translator construes the relevant text as, quote, this having passed, we gave our opinions. Velleius looked upon Cotta's dispute to be truer than Balbus's, but to me, Balbus's argument seemed of a nearer resemblance to truth, unquote. To the translation of probabile as nearer resemblance, the translator adds a note explaining this in terms of academic practice. Quote, spoken after the manner of the academics, of which sect Tully was, who held that our greatest certainties were only more probable appearances of truth, not truths de facto. The Cicero thus found in this particular translation is sympathetic to the presence of divine providence and readily persuaded by the Stoic to this point. The translator uses every tool made available to him to enforce this understanding of the text, an understanding which fortuitously endorses his own support for the Stoic argument presented. Next slide, please. In the early 18th century, the Cambridge scholar John Davis decided to take up the task begun by the German classical scholar Johannes Georgius Graevius uh, in the late 17th century, namely the production of variorum editions of Cicero's works. Davis committed to the production of fresh editions of Cicero's philosophical works, editions which constituted the first efforts in a century to correct the Ciceronian text with manuscript evidence. To this end, in 1718, Davies produced a new edition of De Natura Deorum, printed in Cambridge, and integrating the notes of uh, Paulus Manutius, Dionysius Lambinus, uh, Fulvius Ursinus, and Joachim Camerarius, in an octavo edition, which would be reprinted several times across the 18th century. Davies was primarily a conservative scholar in every sense of the word. Not only an orthodox Anglican clergyman, but a scholar who emphasized manuscript and textual evidence over conjecture and instinct. Holding himself to a particular scholarly standard, his edition was never likely to reach the polemical heights seen with Hind Marshes in 1683, but that did not prevent him from offering the reader guidance on how to interpret the conclusion of Book 3. When commenting on this passage, rather than explicitly dwell on academic methodology as a justification or endorsement of Cicero's declaration of support for the Stoic, Davies directs the reader to the first book of De Divinatione and a comment by Quintus which seems to confirm that Cicero was genuine in his stance. Davies writes, quote, At De Divinatione 1.9, his brother Quintus says, For in the second book, Lucilius, Balbus the Stoic, uh, has made an adequate defense of religion and his argument. As you yourself state at the end of the third book, seem to you nearer the truth. End of quote. Uh, this note maintains the scholarly philological methodology employed by Davies throughout, um, presenting its reading in terms of citations and parallel readings rather than overt opinion, uh, and taking care to include a reference to Augustine's contrasting account of Cicero's motives uh, at this moment in the text. And yet, still, the consequence for the reader is a sense that Cicero's endorsement of Stoic theism and consequently divine providence genuinely reflects his theological position. It's also interesting to note here that Richard Bentley, whose response to Anthony Collins' discourse of free thinking was discussed above, was a close associate of John Davies and was his colleague in Cambridge. Bentley was in fact a dedicatee of Davies' edition of De Natura Deorum, having lent Davies a manuscript to aid his fresh recension of the text. This combined with Davies' personal views as an Anglican clergyman, although like Bentley with latitudinarian sympathies, must surely have influenced how Davies approached <coughs> such controversial elements of the text. Some collaboration does appear to have taken place, as Davies' citation from De Divinatione, used as evidence for his reading of the passage, had been used by Bentley in his response to, Col response to Collins' work in order to rebut Collins' interpretation of De Natura Deorum. Quote, and Cicero himself, who was then auditor at the dispute, thought, though of the same sect with Cotta, declares his own opinion that the Stoics' discourse for providence seemed to him more probable than Cotta's against it, which he repeats again in De Divinatione 1.5. The passage in question, uh, Katie adds, uh, is De Divinatione 1.9, uh, hence the difference in citation. Uh, verse 9, uh, hence the difference in citation. Uh, even a seemingly innocuous note directing the reader to another passage of Cicero's work could therefore help reinforce a particular reading of Cicero's theological sympathies. Should be another slide. 
Oh, there we go. Franklin, 1741. Um, a final intriguing example is not among Collins' collection, in part because it was published over a decade after his death. It remains relevant, however, due to the nature of the Cicero presented therein and the speculation that Collins was actually involved in its production. The work in question is an anonymous English translation uh, printed by Richard Franklin in 1741 with the title Marcus Tullius Cicero of the Nature of the Gods in three books with critical, philosophical and explanatory notes to which is added an inquiry into the astronomy and anatomy of the ancients. Again, a single volume, this time in octavo, running to just under 300 pages. Uh, this translation achieved more commercial success than its predecessor with a reprint in 1758 and then a second edition in 1775, uh, eventually reprinted in 1829. The translator for this work remains anonymous. On the frontispiece of the second edition in 1775, the translator was named as Thomas Franklin, a man well situated to act as a translator of the piece, as it emanated from the press of his father, Richard Franklin. However, another candidate for the translator was put forward by David Berman in 1980, Anthony Collins himself. Collins did claim several times that he would soon be producing translations of De Natura Deorum and De Divinatione to be published by none other than Richard Franklin, as was announced at the end of Collins, an historical and critical essay on the 39 articles of the Church of England, coincidentally, or perhaps not, published in 1724 by Richard Franklin. Quote, Speedily will be published Cicero's treatise uh, of the nature of the gods and of divination, translated into English with annotations in two volumes. End of title. I have my doubts as to whether this is an accurate identification of the figure behind the 1741 translation for several reasons. Katie's doubts. Um, not least of which is the fact that Collins died 12 years before the translation was published. Uh, however, the fact that Collins could be posited as a translator of the piece indicates one thing clearly. Evident in this translation were the kind of radical sympathies which made such an identification plausible. From the outset, the Franklin translation of 1741 efforts are made uh, to create a sense of scholarly integrity. On the frontispiece, attention is drawn to two features of the translation, both of which serve to suggest the erudition of the translator. First, the inclusion of, quote, critical, philosophical, and explanatory, unquote, notes. Uh, an interpretative addition clearly directed at the more learned reader by this phrasing. And second, an appended essay discussing the astronomy and anatomy of the ancients. The scene here is set for a learned work. The translation is preceded only by a two-page preface, brief though it may be. This preface successfully delineates the necessary points, namely the justification for choosing the text, the method applied to the translation and the principles guiding the commentary. Regarding the merits of the text itself, and hence the value of a translation, the translator notes that it provides a detailed representation of ancient theology, mythology and astronomy. On the matter of the methodology applied to the production of the translation, the translator claims to have, quote, consulted all the various readings and chose those which seemed most rational to me. I have endeavoured, in my translation, to preserve Tully's manner of writing, not departing from it even in that particular which has been putted to him by some as a fault, the prolixity of his periods." Unquote. Concerning the goal of those critical notes advertised on the frontispiece, the translator describes their purpose as, quote, to guard the mind against superstition and to prepare it for a fair inquiry into truth without any partial attachment to principles founded only on education and custom, unquote. One principle is already at the forefront, the application of rational criticism, whether that be uh, to the text or to the ideas it contains. The methods and approaches set out in this preface bear all the hallmarks of the freethinker seeking to challenge custom and tradition with reason. This is confirmed by the explanatory comments provided by the translator. The following note accompanies De Natura Deorum 2.9, a passage in which Bibles laments the decline in religious observance among the Romans, who no longer employ auspices appropriately or with suspicion, sufficient respect. Reacting to the anecdote to the order of the order of Savius invoking the Laris to help him find a missing pig, the translator uses the opportunity to challenge the acceptance of such story as truth simply because they have been recorded as such. Quote, Hence we see what little credit ought to be paid to the facts said to be done out of the ordinary course of nature. These miracles are well attested. They were recorded in the annals of a great people, believed by many learned and otherwise sagacious persons. 
and received religious truths by the populace. But the testimony of ancient records, the credulity of some learned men, and the implicit faith of the vulgar can never prove that to have been, which is impossible in the nature of things ever to be. Unquote. Following the principles of free thought, the translator rejects these testimonies, no matter how numerous or authoritative, when the events in question clearly contravene reason and nature. The translator's interpretation of the conclusion of the work further endorses his desire to use De Natura de Orum as a vehicle for championing rational thought before or else. Quote, Cicero, who was an academic, gives his opinion according to the manner of the academics, who looked upon probability and to the semblance of truth as the utmost they could arrive at. Unquote. The emphasis for this particular translator, rather than on the sympathies of Cicero to Stoic theism or otherwise, uh, is on uh, the academic methodology news, uh, the application of judgment and reason to the ideas presented, and the consequent achievement of a conclusion based on the evidence. That said, the refusal of the translator to use is this opportunity to challenge the conclusion further does indicate weaknesses in the identification of Anthony Collins as the translator, as a man so determined to characterize Cicero as a skeptic, would surely not have missed the opportunity presented here. To conclude, uh, this adaptation of uh, De Natura de Orum and De Divi Naturae into words suitable to early enlightenment arguments concerning natural and revealed religion was not a process that began and ended the reader. Those scholars who took upon themselves the tasks of editing, interpreting, and translating the text played a pivotal role in shaping how these works could be understood. The weaponry may have been different. Internal references, translation of terms, representation of academic methodology and so on. But these scholars were invested in conveying a particular interpretation of the text as men like Collins and Bentley. This was clearly also a dialogic process, as editors echoed or challenged the interpretations presented in the theological discourses. A period of scholarship in which the scientific methods popularized after Lachman were only in the earliest infancy. The authority wielded by erudition and editorial practices could be manipulated to facilitate a particular and 